On today's episode of Locked on Canucks, it is the finale of our greatest Canucks series of all time. A full episode dedicated to the two greatest players who ever played for the Vancouver Canucks. It's Locked on Canucks, and it starts now. Your Locked on Canucks, your daily podcast on the Vancouver Canucks. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Locked On Canucks, the show that keeps you locked in on all things Vancouver Canucks. I'm, of course, your host, Justin Pooney. You can find me on Twitter at underscore process sports. Of course, please like and subscribe to our channels on your favorite podcast platform and on YouTube. Again, I want to thank you all for making Locked On Vancouver, or excuse me, Locked On Canucks your first listen of the day. We, of course, are free and available, like I just said, wherever you find your podcast services. I hope you guys had a wonderful long weekend. I did. I took some much needed time to get some rest, relaxation, sit back and enjoy some playoff hockey, playoff basketball. And this was the first year I could say in a long time where I've been more invested in the NHL playoffs, minus the Canucks being in, in 2020, than the NBA playoffs. Because, quite frankly, the NHL playoffs have been a lot better than the NBA playoffs. You look at the NBA playoffs, it's been a blowout for the last two weeks. The whole conference finals has been kind of really boring to watch. The NHL playoffs, the second round has been very compelling. You had, of course, the defending Stanley Cup, two-time defending Stanley Cup champion, Tampa Bay Lightning, blowing out the Florida Panthers in a four-game sweep. You have the Carolina Hurricanes and New York Rangers playing in an extremely, extremely defensive battle. And then out west, Colorado, St. Louis, Nazim Kadri with a hat trick against all that racial, you know, backlash she was getting. All those just idiots out there with the racist taunts towards Naz Kadri gets a hat trick. Uh, and Colorado is now up 3 1 in that series. Let me have the Battle of Alberta where Connor McDavid is playing at another level. Evander Kane is scoring goals like no tomorrow, leading the le- league in playoff goal scoring. Very compelling storylines across the board in the NHL, which is great to see. And it's great exposure for the NHL, especially down south. But, of course, we are Locked on Canucks, a show that keeps you locked in on all things Vancouver Canucks. And it's very special episode today where we're going to spend the full episode completing our greatest Canucks series of all time, where we started off in the 80s with Stan Schmiel, Thomas Gredin, moved to the 90s. Um, and talked about you know those iconic that iconic '94 team that everybody loves in Vancouver. You know Trevor Linden, Kirk McLean, Pavel Bure. Then we go to my favorite teams, the West Coast Express years, where we had guys like we talked about Matthias Olin, Todd Bertuzzi, and of course Marcus Naslin. Then we go to the most dominant era of Vancouver Canucks history, the late 20, 2000s to the early 2010s, where we saw the rise of Roberto Luongo, Kevin Vieksa and Ryan Kessler, as well as the iconic, you know, underdog story of Alex Burroughs. But today, we conclude this series, this chapter, this look back, per se, with the two greatest players in Vancouver Canucks history. The only two players that have won MVPs and scoring titles have over a 1,000 points, 22 and 33, of course, your favorite set of Swedish twins, Henrik and Daniel Sedin. So this episode is going to be from the beginning of their time in Vancouver, all the hardships, all the you know difficult times, to them ascending to all-star players, to superstardom, the 2011 Cup run, and then just their legacy in the community. So it's going to be a ride. It's a great way to cap off this series. And let's just jump right in. So... The Sedins arrived in Vancouver probably under the most unusual of circumstances because GM Brian Burke at the time probably pulled off the greatest draft day wizardry of all time to land both Sedin brothers who, of course, are from Sweden, the same town as Marcus Nasland. And Brian Burke was able to deal Defenseman Brian McCabe, former Leaf, and a first-round pick in the 2000 draft. Of course, the Caesar drafted in 99 to Chicago for the fourth overall pick in 99. He then shipped the fourth overall pick and two third rounds 
to Tampa for the first overall pick. And then he sent that first overall pick to Atlanta, who did not want to take one of the Sedin. So then Brian Burke secured the second and third overall picks. And of course, was given the right to acquire Henrik and Daniel Sedin, where they would come over to Vancouver, not with the iconic uh, red beards or the red goatees that we saw them finish with as fresh-faced teenagers who looked so shy and did not know um, what looked like they were, you know, extremely young kids. And they came onto the scene, and my, oh, my, what a time. So their Faruqi year, of course, they came over to Vancouver in 2000, 2000, 2000, 2001. Henrik had a modest 29 points, while Daniel had 20 goals and 14 assists. It was an early start for the Sedin, as it is for most young players in the NHL that come overseas, adjust, come from overseas, adjusting to the NHL, growing into their man bodies. Um, it was evident, you know, we all remember Brian Burke saying, Sedin is not Swedish for punch me in the, the face in a scrum, cross check me, because of course teams were taking liberties of them in the playoffs. And that was a notion or the Sedin sister notion, which was a dumb thing to begin with, uh, kind of stuck with them for their careers. But I'll touch on their toughness in a second. But those early years for the Sedins were very tough. You know, they would talk about openly about how difficult it was for them to leave home, come to Vancouver, and, you know, establish themselves as NHL players. Um, of course, during the, that era, they were, of course, playing second fiddle to the likes of Marcus Naslin. Todd Bertuzzi and Brendan Morrison. Um, but they displayed flashes. They displayed flashes of, um, I wouldn't say brilliance, but you saw flashes of just the talent that was um, that they had. You know, their first first playoffs, they kind of struggled. And, you know, their first couple of years, they were around the 30-point mark. Um, they were kind of, you know, hovering around that, you know, every point or so every other game. Um, and that's when, you know, they never really had a first, a true uh, line mate. You know, they had guys like Trent Klatt and, you know, they weren't really in shape. Um, I think we, at that time, Mark Crawford was pushing them very hard and they didn't use understood later on in the career, what type of workout warriors they were at that point in time. They weren't there yet. They hadn't developed those traits. They were kind of pudgy a little bit. You know, they weren't as lean and slender as they were. But after that lockout, you saw them take the next steps, and the next steps develop. You saw the hard work, the the dog determination, this the just the work ethic that put they put in. So after this break, we're gonna talk about the ascension after those tough beginnings into superstardom. And just how dominant they were during that period. But first, I want to talk to you guys about Built. Built. I know you guys love brownies. I'd certainly love brownies. But you know what? I love more brownie batter. Sometimes I eat half the batter just while I'm making the brownies. Imagine if you lick that brownie spatula clean and get some protein in it. You're in luck because Built has a new creation. And this one is better than ever. The brownie batter puff. You might. You heard me right. This puff takes protein bars to a whole new level, and they're available right now on Built.com. Have you tried the Built Puffs yet? I'm not sure what you're waiting for. Puffs are a chocolate-covered marshmallow protein bar. That's right. Delicious flavored marshmallows covered in 100% real chocolate with 140 calories, 17 grams of protein, only 7 grams of sugar. Brownie batter puffs are the pink, perfect pick-me-up Excuse me for any day. All Built Puffs are covered in 100% real chocolate. That means... With Built, you can eat healthy and actually enjoy doing it. They're made with collagen protein, which your body absorbs more efficiently and provides tons of health benefits. The b brownie batter puffs, excuse me, it's a tongue twister. The brownie batter puffs will have you completely forgetting that you're eating a protein bar. No need to pinch yourself. This is real life. Go to Built.com to get brownie batter puffs right now. Go to Built.com once again. Use promo code LOCKED15 to get 15% off your order. Once again, use promo code LOCKED15 for 15% off at Built.com. So, we go back 
to the legacy of Henrik and Daniel Sedin. Um, you know, it was tough, you know. And I, I forgot to mention, we got to give credit to Mark Crawford, who stuck with them, gave them, you know, opportunity on the power play, even when fans kind of turned on them and, you know, didn't want them to get power play time, didn't want them to get ice time, um, didn't want to... Just you know, you know how the Vancouver market kind of turns on people after they struggle a little bit. You know, it's a very fickle market, and thank God, um, Mark Crawford stuck with them and gave them time. Thank God, guys like Dave Nonis and Brian Burke didn't trade them. You know, you see, um, in professional sports, a lot teams give up on young assets because they're not providing immediate dividends, um, and that, um. Had the Canucks traded the Sedins potentially with what people wanted back then, this franchise, this whole um, history of this franchise might look totally different. And as I mentioned, the first years, the first few years were er uh, very difficult for um, the Sedins. But after that lockout, you saw them take the steps necessary to come and devolve into elite NHL players. Look, 05, 06 was the start of something special where these guys averaged, you know, for almost damn near 80 plus 75 plus point 70 plus point seasons every year. You know, Daniel, you know, became a 30 goal scorer, a 40 goal scorer. Henrik Sedin became, um, you know, an assist machine averaging almost 60 assists. Some one season he had 80 assists. That's of course the year he won the art Ross trophy. Um, but what was so special watching Henrik and Daniel Sedin play was, again, I, you saw them grow into their man bodies, grow into that physique, and you just saw how strong they were. I was talking with that Sedin sister narrative when these guys played the game in the dirty areas. They weren't finesse guys that would stand on the fringes of the ice and then, you know, just play on the outside. These guys were playing. What was their, what was their biggest thing? Cycling the puck. When you cycle the puck, your board work has to be on point. You have to be tough on your skates. You can't fall down. And the Sedins were able to cycle that puck, wear teams down, puck possession. And it was amazing to see. You know, I talked about Alex Bros in my other greatest Canucks series episode where he was so smart to just, you know, find the open spots in the ice and work that cycle game brilliantly to perfection where he could find the open seam and know he's going to get open pass or keep this puck down low. Tire out those and that's what the Canucks at their peak of that dominant era were so great at cycling the puck, possessing the puck, thanks to Henrik and Daniel Sedin. Everybody talks about, you know, the you know, the in-between goal against Calgary, or you know, the the one-handed goals, or whatever they did, right? But for me, just those iconic shifts where they just had the puck on a string and were just cycling it and tiring defense over there, just possessing. That's the puck for, you know, what felt like forever in the offensive end was amazing. And after the lockout, you saw the change where, you know, the West Coast Express era kind of was ending. Well, obviously with the trade of Bertuzzi and the decline of Brendan Morrison. And you saw Marcus Naslin kind of phase out as well, where then you saw the Sedins take over that leadership. And they credit that to Marcus Naslin, who was, you know, the leader of them, leader of that team and kind of like their mentor uh, when they first came in the league. And you see... You know, they weren't raw, raw guys, just like Marcus Allen, but they led by example. You know, there's a whole story of every year at training camp, they'd win the gross grind. They'd be the first guys up the mountain. That's setting an example. You know, the last, always working out in the gym, in the workout, weight, weight room, excuse me, the hardest working guys on the team. And that is how you develop a championship mindset, in my personal opinion. If your leaders, like, I don't, if I'm on a team and I see, you know, my best players putting maximum effort in every Every game, every game, every practice, that should push you harder innately to want to, you know, if my best players who have won MVPs and scoring titles and all of this, all-star games, all these accolades, and they are putting in the work like nobody else, that should push you harder because if they're already that good and they have the talent to do that, but they're working on it continuously, if I'm not that talented, I have to work, you know, just as hard, if not harder to reach my level. And that right there is leadership itself. I don't think you need to have a raw, raw speech and, you know, you have to, you know, yell and scream. If you, if your leader comes in, works um, hard every day, that is what the Henrik and Daniel Sedin did. And that's one of their lasting legacies, in my personal opinion, where, you know, 
they they were just the ultimate workers. I mean, then you saw because of the work they put in, they became, you know, the first person to ever win a Hart Trophy, winning the Lester B. Pearson Award or the Ted Lindsay Award now, back-to-back scoring champs, right? Leading a team to back-to-back President's Trophies, leading a team to Game 7 of the Stanley Cup Finals. And then everybody always talks about, and going back to the toughness thing, Everybody talks about, you know, when Brad Marchand's punching Henrik and Daniel Sedin um, in the face uh, in that scrum, he doesn't do anything. Well, when you look at it, what were they going? What were they going to do? They weren't fighters. They were they were told that whole year. The whole mantra of that Canucks team that year was, "Don't fight back, get a penalty, and you know, draw a penalty, and we'll score on the power play." Now it didn't help in that Stanley Cup Final series that um, they. The refs didn't call as many penalties and the Canucks power play went dry, but that happens, right? That definitely happens. But when you going back to that 2011 season, that 2010, 2011 season, Henrik Sedin was named the captain and rightly so he, you know, was, as I mentioned, a great leader, you know, that year he was coming off fresh off a season where he won the Hart trophy and the Art Ross trophy. Um, and that year, you know, had 22 points in the playoffs, 94 points, Daniel, um, that 2010 2011 season had 104 points, of course, capturing the Art Ross trophy. 41 goals had 20 points in 20 playoff games. Um, and you just saw them. It's one of my biggest regrets that they lost because the narrative kind of the Sadine sisters stuck around. Of course, the, the you know, those rats like Dave Boland saying, like and the Blackhawks, uh, saying they share a bit, just you know, clowning on them and um. It always angered me because these guys were the classiest guys in the NHL. You know, the utmost class and dignity of human beings you could ever ask for. The perfect uh, role models you would want to look up to. Guys that were upstanding in the community, donating money to BC Children's Hospital, donating money to BC Children's Hospital and doing so without anybody wanting anybody to know. Right? So... You know, the Sedins, I think, were just the most disrespected superstars in the NHL, in my opinion. Just by their just by their peers and by the local media, I feel. Um, I felt they never got what they deserved because, you know, they weren't... In that era, you look at guys like, you know, Sidney Crosby was, you know, doing great things and Bill, the Sid the Kid from the beginning. You had guys who, in my personal opinion, Jonathan Taves was nowhere near as good as Henrik and Daniel Sedin, but still played on great Chicago teams and was able to become a top NA 100 player uh, when I just don't think he didn't deserve it. Um, and then you look at, you know, the, you know, guys like Ovechkin. Well, I think we could say when you look at that era, the late 2000s, early 2010s, that, you know, six to seven years span, um, you know, you have, of course, Crosby's, the, the Malkins, the Ovechkins, the um, Dowdies, you know, all, all of that, right? Um, but they were not named to top one, the top 100 level players of all time. And uh, I mean, I get it. There's a lot of, you know, there's guys that, you know, of course, Angel has been around for 100. Remember they did the 100 year season, the Sedins weren't announced. I knew, kind of knew they weren't going to be um, included in it, but. You know, the whole captain series mantra, Jonathan Taves, who I feel was extremely overrated, an overrated player um, because he played for Chicago and because he was Canadian and because he was captain serious, the whole mantra like that, the whole media play like that, that put him in um, the top 100. I just feel like during that era, Hen- Henrik and Danielson were better players. Henrik and Danielson were better players than Jonathan Taves for sure. Now, did it help that Jonathan Taves put on a better team? Of course. But, um, just to kind of wrap up Henrik and Daniel Sedin's superstardom and to stay on track with that, excuse me, because I get so ranting with Jonathan. But look, what I w- there might be younger viewers out here that never really watch Henrik and Daniel Sedin play at their primes. And what I attest you guys to do is go and watch Henrik and Daniel Sedin highlights. Just their shifts. Just the shifts. They just control the puck. And they play the game. And that is the testament of true greatness, in my opinion. You play the game at your speed, you play the game that you play, and there's nothing that anybody else can do to stop you. Everybody knew the Sedins wanted to cycle the puck, play that puck possession game, play on the boards, but nobody could stop them. Nobody could stop Henrik and Daniel Sedin 
uh, in that puck cycle for their doing their those, those prime years, racked up back to back hundred point seasons, um, scoring thirty plus goals. You know, like I said, six, all the all the numbers you guys already know. What they were able to do um, was downright scary. The two of them were the two best players in the league and the two best Vancouver Canucks who ever lived. No questions about it. That is why their numbers are retired. They'll probably be immortalized in the city of Vancouver. That is why they are the two greatest Canucks who ever lived. And coming up after this break, I want to talk about off the ice. Because, again, as we've mentioned about all these greatest Canucks of all time, majority of them have been Canucks for life. And we remembered for Canucks for life. But also their ability to embrace themselves and integrate themselves with the province of British Columbia and the city of Vancouver. So we're going to touch on that after this break. Okay, so we are back. Locked on Canucks, greatest Canucks series of all time. Highlighting Henrik and Daniel Sedin, the greatest Canucks who ever lived. Talked about their early beginnings, the crazy trade by Brian Burke, the struggles. Thank God for Mark Crawford, Brian Burke, Dave Nunes for sticking with them and not trading them and allowing them to grow. Thank you to Elaine Vino for giving them the opportunity and Mike Gillis for resigning them after he said and questioned because there was times they could have left. They could have left as a free agent, but they chose to re-sign for less to stay together and stay in Vancouver. Remember um, when Gillis first came in, I believe 2008, um, he challenged them in the public. And then you saw them take their game to the next level by saying they're not frontline players. Well, they proved damn well proved they were frontline players after that. Um, so thank you to this uh, Mike Gillis for re-signing them and all that stuff. But um you know, we talked about the turning point after, you know, the 05, 06 season where they played with Anson Carter. You know, they kind of took off after that. Um, and, you know, we talked about how, you know, the team became theirs. They were great leaders. The first to work, the last one there, rose them to the ranks of the NHL. Um, the other thing I want to talk about is just how great they were off the ice. Um, these two were two guys that gave back to the community of Vancouver extremely, integrated themselves the province of British Columbia um, unlike any other. Um, you saw the Canucks took out a whole week um, basically of their retirement ceremony, honoring not only their on-ice things, but at one point their off-ice things. Um, you know, they were, as I mentioned earlier, they donated $1.5 million to BC Children's Hospital. Um, and then they also have their own Sedin Foundation. Um, I just feel that those two were just, as I mentioned, they were the nicest guys. And you know they always talk about hockey. You have to have bite to you. You have to have edge. You know, you have to be kind of a you know, a bad boy um, to be successful. You know, um, there's the thing. You know, Aaron Rodgers is a bad man in football. Henrik and Daniel Sedin weren't bad men. They were upstanding humans great individuals every time um the canucks played poorly or every year after an elimination or a heartbreaking playoff defeat um, as the leaders of the team they stepped up and they dealt with the media especially in a city where the media um, can turn on you or can sorry not turn on you but can question you can be very difficult to deal with um can just you know some some guys aren't built that way and we just you know say i don't want to talk to the media we've seen that before uh, where these professional athletes just choose to, you know, not talk to the media or be evasive or be, um, for lack of a better word, term pricks um, to the media. But Henrik and Daniel Sedin were not that. Henrik and Daniel Sedin were not only the two greatest um, on ice players the Vancouver Canucks have ever had, but probably the two of the the two greatest off ice individuals ever employed by the Vancouver Canucks. Um, as I said, they were leaders you know, in the team, in the community. Um, and for that, they have to be celebrated. Like I said, um, we all know the on-ice accolades are great, but also, more importantly, the off-ice. Um, guys that, who, for me personally, like, you know, I wasn't the biggest Sedin fans um, at a certain point. Like I said, I said Ryan Kessler during that era was my favorite Canuck because he played with that bite, played with that edge. Um, and was an ultimate competitor. But the Sedins were just as competitive. They just did it in a different way. And it took me a few years till I got older to understand that, that you know, as their career was winding down, um, that these guys wanted to win, but they didn't show it in the form that many people um, are used to with athletes, you know, very 
loud and you know emotional, emotional showing emotions. The Sedins were like that; they're very cerebral, um, very quiet, but just as deep competitors and fierce competitors that wanted to win. And you always knew that when Henrik would say something, the media kind of you know, you know, remember he said something about the young players in Vancouver. Everybody's like, "Wow, I've never seen them before." But then. You know, that just showed you how they wanted to be successful. They wanted this franchise to be successful. And you're seeing that now that they're brought back. They want to be a part of this team, this franchise, and the city uh, forming into a winner because they pay, they they will forever be, um, you know, Vancouver is their home. And they'll always be, you know, <laughs> I might say Trevor Linden can run for premier and win in British Columbia, but I think Henrik and Daniel Sedin, if they ever chose to, run for office or run for the legislative assembly in, in British Columbia, they would have a really good chance of winning because everybody loves them. Everybody respects them because they were just outstanding players, outstanding members of the community and just outstanding people at the end of the day. Um, and they will forever be immortalized. They will be hockey hall of famers. Yes, they both will be. Do not tell me they're not because they have the numbers, they have the accolades, they have the whole thing. Um, and when you tell the story of the Vancouver Canucks, you cannot tell the story without any of these guys I talked about. Without any of these guys I talked about, you can never tell the complete story of the Vancouver Canucks. But the most dominant era, the most successful era of Canucks hockey uh, was centered around the Sedins. And forever, those guys will be the greatest Canucks. Well, not forever, but you know, until we see somebody to knock them off that pedestal, which who knows what we'll ever see that. Even ever again in NHL history, when are you ever going to see two twin brothers play in an NHL city for their entire careers and dominate like no other, play on the same line um, and just be, you'll never see again in, in the NHL, maybe even sports history, in my opinion, um, two twins like that. And um, I was glad I got to witness it. I was glad I got to see the highs. I was glad I got to see the lows. I was glad I got to witness um, just two upstanding individuals represent my team, my city, uh, my province with the utmost class and dignity. And for that, all I have to say is thank you, Henrik and Daniel Sedin. Thank you um, for the memories. Thank you for, you know, 2011. Thank you for the Art Rosses, the MVPs, um, everything. Thank you for the amazing final game where you scored the game winner and you guys had that amazing victory lap. I had almost had tears in my eyes then just because I was it was so amazing. Um, so yes, that is the end of our greatest Canucks series. Uh, it's time for a new chapter, a new off-season content thing uh, creation. So uh, stick around. Tomorrow we'll have some more news. It's kind of a slow weekend news-wise for the Canucks. Um, Brock Besser, um, news, you know, new assistant coaches. We'll get on all into that tomorrow, and also some more fun topics about the past history of the Vancouver Canucks. So that is all we have for today. This has been Locked On Canucks. Um, for your second list, I want to thank you, excuse me, for making Locked On Canucks your first listen of the day. For your second listen, Locked On NHL. From the first round matchups to each Stanley Cup kiss, Locked On NHL covers the NHL playoffs like no other. Hear the latest news and opinions from local experts every Monday through Friday. That's free and available wherever you get your podcast services. Guys, take care. Stay safe.